Hello, good afternoon from our virtual studio. Welcome to our event, uh, to our online event, which uh, this time we are co-organizing with our partners from the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Belarus. And it's part of our campaign, Thinking Europe, our common house. Today we will, uh, we will discuss the recent developments in Belarus, the radical change uh, within Belarusian society, which is happening at the moment, uh, the role of the European Union, in support of the democratic movement, but also we will tackle upon the involvement of the Moscow administration in, uh, in these events. We will also speak about the future, what lies ahead for uh, Alexander Lukashenko and the people of Belarus. For this occasion, we have three excellent speakers today with us. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you, Ms. Uh, first of all, Mr. Andrius Kubilius, who is a member of the European Parliament and co-president of the Euronest Parliamentary Assembly. He is also a member of the honorary board of the Martin Center and has served uh, twice as the Prime Minister of uh, Lithuania. Uh, then we will have Artyom Schreibman, a political analyst based in Minsk, also the founder of Sense Analytics, a political consultancy, and he is the, uh, Schreibman uh, is the former political editor of the TUTVY website, who is the most popular non-state uh, media outlet in Belarus. And last but not least, uh, Frana Gliachorka, a uh, journalist, activist, international relations advisor to Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, who was runner-up uh, in, the, in the presidential elections. And uh, he is also a non-resident uh, fellow at the Atlantic Council Euras Eurasian Center, also a filmmaker and vice president of the Digital Communication Network and consultant for US Agency for Global Media. Welcome to all of you. Uh, I hope we'll have a fruitful discussion. I would like to begin first with Mr. Kubilius. Uh, I would like to tackle upon the conclusions by the Council of the EU, uh, who imposed, uh, which imposed restrictive measures against uh, 40 individuals who will be who are identified as responsible for repression and intimidation. And these restrictive measures include travel ban and asset freeze. Also, the Council called for new free and uh, fair elections without external interference and uh, also called, the, uh, called on the Belar uh, Belarusian authorities to end violence and repression and start an inclusive national dialogue. How do you, how, what is your stand on this? How do you see this, uh, Mr. Kubilis? Uh, please, uh, I would just want to remind the speakers when you're not speaking, just to mute the microphone. Mr. Kubilis, please, the floor, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Katerina, and uh, really a pleasure and honor to be part of this uh, very important event, and especially with such uh, Belarusian, you know, experts. Of course, being from from uh, Lithuania, all of us, we are learning in some way experts on, on Belarus. Uh, but, uh, well, you know, I will try very briefly to say just what's, uh, what what uh, what is happening here in, in Brussels and what do we think you now about what can be than uh, looking into the future. First of all, of course, uh, you know, from the very beginning, uh, we consider that uh, we're facing uh, and we're witnessing uh, really a democracy revolution going on in Belarus. There are different reasons, uh, you know, why it started to happen, why, you know, it started to happen in such an unexpected way. I think that there are some uh, historical tendencies uh, which are common not only for Belarus but for all post-Soviet uh, area, especially for uh, those countries where still authoritarian regimes are, are ruling. Now, uh, really, when we are looking into how things are happening, really, we see uh, we are absolutely you know, astonished and surprised by the will of uh, Belarusian people to stand against the uh, Lukashenko regime and to continue, you know, their, their struggle. And the recent reports from uh, yesterday's, you know, march of uh, partisans or whatever, how it's called, or today's, you know, pensioners marching in, in, in center of Minsk, it's, it's something amazing. Uh, when we're looking into, into the whole picture, and I will try to very briefly to say where I see Euro, we can, we can name three major factors which uh, will influence uh, the whole development of uh, Belarusian revolution. First of all, of course, the first factor, the most important factor is Belarusian people. 
who are continuing to 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 go into protests, who are standing against uh, against Lukashenko regime, and who are demanding uh, you know simple simple democracy, uh, which they you know voted in a in a clear majority for Svetlana Tsikhanovskaya, and the results were stolen. Second factor, of course, is uh, you know. Uh, uh, the West and EU, which are standing together with Belarusian people, but who has quite a limited influence on Lukashenko himself. And the third factor is Moscow, Kremlin, Putin himself, who are uh, perhaps the only ones who are supporting uh, openly Lukashenko. So, uh, and Lukashenko is depending on that support. And the question is how long it will it will continue, because developments in Belarus, I think, in some way, from geopolitical point of view, is a trap for uh, Mr. Putin, uh, because he cannot, uh, you know, support uh, uh, people's revolution. But if he will stay with Lukashenko for a very long period of time, he can become toxic in the eyes of Belarusian people, like Lukashenko is toxic. So uh, here, EU, what EU is trying to do, really, is on one side, of course. It makes pressure on Lukashenko regime with sanctions, you know, including Lukashenko himself. From another side, you know, uh, support for demand of uh, people to have, uh, you know, new elections, to have possibility for democracy, also is in the mind of European Union. That is why EU is speaking about what we call, you know, Marshall Plan for uh, Democratic Belarus. Uh, we are trying to plan and to forecast what will be the biggest needs, you know, for democratic Belarus. And we see really that economical situation and economical support uh, for democratic Belarus will be uh, most important. I would like to see much more of uh, EU uh, attempts, you know, from EU leadership also to make uh, uh, pressure, diplomatic pressure, political pressure on, on Kremlin and on Putin. Because uh, uh, his support is, is, is the reason why Lukashenko is still in power. I don't know. I, for me, it would be very interesting to listen to Artyom and, and Franek. Uh, what does it mean? Why, why, for example, Lukashenko started to release? Or, or, or what does it mean? This, you know, famous uh, his conversation in, 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 in prison with political prisoners. And what does it mean? You know that some of them political prisoners have started to be released. But uh, uh, I hope that really uh, our our joint efforts, uh, you know, here in, inside of EU, together with Belarusian people, at the end will bring uh, will bring uh, the outcome which we want to see, which Belarusian people wants to see. You know that uh, doors will be open for uh, democratic development. And second point, which we are discussing here in in, in, in Parliament, and of course that international justice. It would be brought also, you know, to those penetrators who, who, who made all those, you know, criminal atrocities against the Belarusian people. And unmute your microphone, Katerina. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, also, in the European Parliament, you spoke about instigating an international investigation of crimes. And there were also uh, there was also an exchange of ideas about so whether it's time for a special envoy uh, to Minsk, uh, also the church to get involved maybe in Belarus or to even expel Belarus from the Eastern Partnership. How? What is your take on this? What do you think? On on Friday we had a really very important uh, discussion here in the Parliament in. Uh, Human Rights Committee together with Foreign Affairs Committee on uh, how uh, international community could help uh, to achieve uh, justice for Belarusian people and to and to start you know criminal investigation in in those crimes which Oman uh, you know did since since the beginning of revolution and there are it's yeah it's it's not you know there are some some issues which we still need to discuss. Uh, we we see really that you know justice issue is very important. Uh, it's very clear that domestic uh, Belarusian you know justice system is not able to provide any kind of justice. So that's why international community needs to step in. So first of all, we are looking how to establish some kind of coordination center, maybe somewhere close to Belarusian borders, maybe in Vilnius or in Warsaw or somewhere else, which would uh, assist uh, you know uh, those. Uh, 
human rights activists which are collecting uh, witnesses and evidence in Belarus of all those crimes. And second, we're looking how to establish some kind of uh, 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 council of experts or, you know, informal council, informal, informal body of uh, uh, international uh, law experts, which would look into possibilities how, you know, legal justice can be brought. And, uh, and here are some ideas about so-called uh, universal jurisdiction of different countries, including, including for example, Lithuania or, or Poland, which can start to raise uh, legal cases against uh, some of those um, uh, perpetrators. So that's, that's what, uh, what we are looking for. Besides that, there are discussions inside of the parliament, and I think that the European Parliament really can make a, an important uh, job because the European Parliament is maybe more dynamic if to, if to compare with some other European EU institutions. We're looking how to establish high level uh, mission uh, in some way similar to what was established back in 2012 or 2013 for Ukraine when Quest, uh, former President Kwasniewski and former President of European Parliament Cox were appointed to to, to, to be part of that, uh, to, 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 to be in, in that mission. And, and such kind of high-level mission, I think it would be very much uh, needed now, really, both to consolidate EU position and to, and to speak out very clearly what, what is uh, very much needed. So those are ideas which, among other ideas, we are discussing here in, in, in Brussels. Uh, thank you. Let's move now from Brussels to Minsk. Uh, we have there uh, Frank Vietrka, who would, I would ask uh, if you can give us a picture from the ground what is happening in Belarus, uh, in Belarus at the moment. In Minsk, we see uh, hundreds of thousands of people on the streets being peaceful, not instigating any violence. Uh, we see the inv invincibility of the Belarusian people to fight for this cause, for the democratic cause. So can you describe us of the atmosphere, what is going on there? Uh, this week, uh, I think that there were 240 new detainees uh, emerged from this protest, which were happening at the weekend. So could you just describe us what is the atmosphere there now? Pranak, the floor, the floor is yours. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm not actually in Minsk, I'm in Vilnius, uh, but it's also a lot of uh, life, a lot of things going on here. Uh, um, so basically, I'm, I'm working with Svetlana Tsikhanovska and all the groups and um, initiatives that are trying to uh, push um, harder on, on these changes, on the transformation. So the most important asset we have right now is the street protest. And the most important task is right now to give energy, to give hope, to give inspiration uh, to those people. Because definitely we see that people are getting tired, but the regime is getting tired too. And uh, oh, if we will be able to sustain this energy, uh, this then the revolution, the uprising, might uh, prevail. Uh, so right now we see that Lukashenko is uh, trying to make some steps forward. Um, uh, it's not real, uh, not real dialogue yet, but at least you know this visit of KGB. Perhaps he wanted to make it look as the um, as the step from his side. Also, we see the change of the uh, arrest uh, from the. Um, uh, several several persons were moved from the KGB prison to the home arrest. Uh, so of course it's not it's not big change, and it doesn't change already becomes liberal, but it's the result of, of the pressure of the street primarily. Uh, so uh, this pressure, which is coming from uh, the street protest on one hand, and the political inst like. Um, Coordination Council and Svetlana Tsikhanovska as the leader of this uh, uprising, it creates, uh, it must create a critical mass which will force Lukashenko or the regime, uh, not necessarily will be at this table, uh, to, to go uh, and to accept uh, the dialogue. 
And this dialogue, uh, perhaps it will not be the traditional dialogue when people are sitting at the round table. It can be something else. I think it can be, it, it can look as the bargaining on the uh, on the new elections, on the conditions, how these new elections will be held, uh, what the guarantees will to, to be given to the Lukashenko's regime and uh, Lukashenko himself. And this is what we expect. Uh, on the international level, Svetlana Tsikhanovska and, uh, and the whole team is working on the delegitimization of Lukashenko, which makes him uh, uh, not just uh, um, declared the legitimate ruler, but which uh, puts uh, Russia in the very tough position. Because basically support of uh, legitimate Lukashenko creates um, a very uncomfortable uh, situation when Moscow um, uh, supports uh, uh, the problematic regime, uh, which can cause also consequences on, on Moscow. And um, uh, definitely, they pretend to have good relationship right now at this moment. I mean, Moscow and Minsk. But in fact, we all understand that this relationship are very uh, fragile. They will not sustain. And we have to be ready that Russia will be uh, changing its plans, its tactic, and it will give up with Lukashenko at some point when it will be ready and um, will we'll, uh, propose its own scenario. And uh, our goal is right now to strengthen institutions, to strengthen um, this uh, grassroots initiatives and self-organization of the people in Belarus and those on protest in order when these changes uh, begin uh, to sustain the civil society as the major player in this political transformation. And we also have to make sure that when the changes are uh, happening, when new elections are uh, um, scheduled, that uh, the electoral committee commissions and the, uh, and, and the democratic process uh, is ensured. This would be hard because we, even if Lukashenko steps down, we can expect the revenge uh, from um, regime affiliated forces, but also uh, by, by Russia uh, itself. Um, and, and my last point is that uh, we, we have absolutely, we are witnessing absolutely unique um, societal mobilization. Uh, we see how the new uh, structures are being formed. These structures like solidarity foundations, uh, different organizations by sportsmen, athletes, um, medics, all these new organizations that are being formed uh, again, grassroots from bottom to top, all of them will uh, uh, will create the new basis, the skeleton of this new statehood, of this new Belarusian state after Lukashenko, which will be, uh, I hope, built on democratic principles and, uh, and values. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's speak a little bit about Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. Uh, she is a woman. Uh, she has no background in politics. Uh, at first, she didn't want power, but her husband was being detained and being prevented to run in the presidential race. Uh, and then she, because he was detained, uh, she took over and uh, she became the presidential candidate. Also, she tried to sense what the people think. Uh, people notice her as, a, as this is a people's person. She was also being threatened. Now she is in exile in Belarus. And she is a new face in, uh, in, uh, in Belarusian politics and uh, probably because of the fatigue in the mainstream opposition uh, in your society. How do you see her role in this? Uh, in general, you are, you are working with her. Uh, how is she, what is her? Uh, how to put it, what is her view, what is her vision about this, about the upcoming process, which are, uh, which are uh, following in Belarus? Uh, I, I, I guess that um, it's not the problem at all that she is a professional politician. And I think uh, we are seeing uh, for last years that actually non-professional politicians are leading many countries and very getting very successful. And her main um, power is her honesty, her authenticity, 
she is a representative of Belarusian people. And uh, uh, she transformation um, in Belarus. Recently, she feels very well what she feels very well what ordinary Belarusians uh, feel. Uh, so my uh, understanding is that she is basically embodiment of this process, of this transformation of Belarus uh, identity. And I will say that we are witnessing or in uh, the of the uh, meetings, and I was also attending uh, most of them with uh, Angela Merkel or with uh, Emmanuel Macron. I saw perhaps not professional politician, but I saw real representative of the people. And she's, uh, she's, she's not speaking as traditional opposition leaders of Belarus. She is speaking as the new person, and she always repeat that, you know, uh, guys, I, I don't ask you. Just consider us as the partners. You know, we have this and this right now, and we need your help. And this always gets positive feedback, because the Western politicians, for example, they're not used to such um, direct uh, honesty. Uh, and um, uh, she always gets a lot of uh, points uh, being so sincere and so open about her expectations. Uh, she uh, has great team in Vilnius. Uh, she has great relationship with the Coordination Council, which is partly in Belarus, partly in Warsaw. And I think uh, there is no doubt that she is currently the, the absolute uh, uh, leader of Belarusian uprising. And uh, all the all the forces, including the street protest organizers, they are um, kind of loyal somehow to her, and uh, she is definitely the most powerful uh, political person right now in in the Belarusian political process. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just want to make a small remark that Frana Gviachorka will have to disconnect sooner than uh, than the rest of the speakers. Uh, he will not be, unfortunately, able to stay with us until the end. And I also want to make another remark to our audience that feel free to pose your questions below in the comments. Uh, now I will go to our third speaker, Artyom Schreibman. I actually read an analysis and it was published two years ago. And in all possible scenarios being developed about the future of Belarus and the possible regime change and the end of the 26-year-old era of Alexander Lukashenko, not even the most optimistic scenario did foresee that this will come. So what is happening in Belarus will come only in two years' time, actually now. So people finally to take courage to stand against the regime. I would like to get you back a little bit, uh, a little bit in the past, but in the recent past, recent history. Can you give us a short recent chronology on what led to this sequence of events in Belarus? Yeah, sure. And uh, thank you so much for, for, for inviting me. Uh, I think that you're asking a very uh, well well pointed question because Nobody foresaw this precisely for the reason that nobody could foresaw such a quantity and quality of mistakes on behalf of Belarusian uh, authorities. Uh, what Alexander Lukashenko has done in this year has been basically a cascade of uh, like shooting in his own foot from the start. It is not to disregard the role of the civil society and the horizontal mobilization and of political leaders of Belarus. I mean, now... I don't know, even the generations of political leaders just in this year. Well, when the first line get jailed, their you know, second line gets to the first ranks and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, it is also, I mean, Alexander Lukashenko made a lot to make this happen. And he started with the coronavirus uh, handling or rather mishandling. Uh, the way he treated his society, our society during the coronavirus was a trigger uh, for many previously non-politicized people and non-politicized groups like medics, teachers, uh, just parents of kids who have to be sent to school um, amidst the pandemic. 
people of the old age, I mean, retired, retired people, as you can see now from this pensioners march that is happening right now as we speak, uh, all his traditional constituencies have saw, have seen in, with their own eyes that the image of the state as the caring paternalistic state is not longer in any way relevant to what is happening in Belarus. So the Belarusian state basically abandoned its key ideological uh, facet, uh, that it is caring about the, the vulnerable, it is caring about the ordinary people, and the pandemic uh, revealed that it's not no, no more the case. Then there was a presidential campaign, which was uh, surprisingly um, you know, announced to be held in August, uh, the time for uh, the regime sought the worst for political mobilization, but actually, which appeared to be the best for political mobilization because it's a hot time of the year, because people do not, actually, students do not uh, yet at their, you know, uh, studies. Uh, because of the pandemic, people did not get to vacations. And so uh, because of the pandemic, many of the migrant workers of, from Belarus who previously worked in Russia and Poland have been stuck in Belarus within, within the borders closed, not by Lukashenko, but by all the neighbors of Belarus, because Belarus did not close its borders, but all, it, all of its neighbors did. Uh, so all of this created this very, you know, uh, inflammable mix for, for the upcoming presidential election, because the society was politicized, the Lukashenko's approval rating based on the coronavirus pandemic, but also based on the poor perf economic performance, the support rate was plummeting, uh, and they did not read it in time. And they, uh, instead of trying to somehow mitigate this upcoming storm, they instead initiated the largest crackdown any electoral campaign in Belarus has ever seen. We had more than 20 political prisoners even before the election day. This has never happened even in, in, in the time of Lukashenko's rule, where the repressions usually followed presidential elections, but never preceded them. And so this just angered the society further. And then the popular oppositional candidate were deregistered or not allowed to run rather, they will not even register it. And that was another unprecedented move even by the Belarusian standards. Um, and uh, then, as you all know, the 80% was announced, uh, which is not, you know, in any way plausible figure. And finally, I think the last and the most consequential mistake, or rather crime, uh, or at least immoral act committed by these authorities were the, the repressions uh, and torture uh, following the election day. I think this was not just... Uh, as one, one statement has put it, is it was not just the crime, it was a mistake, it was even, more, even worse. The problem is that uh, Belarusian authorities underestimated how much the society despises violence uh, and how much, as you see now in this protest, how averse to violence Belarusian society is. I mean, the dedication to, to peaceful protest is remarkable in this, uh, in this movement. And this society, these people, were was basically... Uh, forced to experience this unprecedented by European standards amount of torture, violence, and I mean killings as well. And so all of this created what we what we see now, but also the work of brave, brave women and men of the civil society who actually in this electoral campaign, and it's it, it, it's unfortunate that Franak has left because I wanted to compliment him and his team. Because um, Svetlana Tikhanovska and others, and like this women trio that were on the uh, pedestal of Belarusian po po politics, or uh, generally the civil society of Belarus now and its leaders, have not made so many mistakes as their predecessors from the traditional opposition usually did. Of course, they had the different society on their hands, they had different kind of protest movement, they have way weaker regime. At the same time, uh, I would I would like to stipulate this that most things that um, most of the moves that Svetlana Tikhanovsky and her predecessors make in the hindsight are politically correct. Uh, they are doing the things that need to be done precisely to trigger this kind of uh, social response and and to maintain the peacefulness of the protests, maintain their uh, gravity and maintain uh, the pressure, uh, international pressure on, on Belarusian authorities. So I'll probably stop here. I think it's, it's enough for background. 
Perfect, thank you. It was really insightful and comprehensive. I would like to go back to Mr. Kubilius. In your uh, opinion piece, which you wrote, uh, published in the Martin Center website, you said that this is a democratic revolution, not a geopolitical one. And this is some, your opinion is being shared by, by many people. But of course, we if we look at the big elephant in the room, which we already mentioned, uh, we must look into Moscow and its role in this whole development. How do you think, uh, is this, what is happening in Belarus now, is affected by Lukashenko's relationship with Vladimir Putin? And how is this actually affecting the future of their relations? Could you please elaborate a bit on that? Well, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, the field where we need to move into, you know, uh, a little bit from Belarus into what is happening in Russia itself. And uh, I think that uh, we are witnessing some kind of, uh, you know, big tectonic uh, developments in the whole area, what we can call, you know, post-Soviet area. And, uh, and, and that is, uh, you know, why really uh, it's important for us uh, to understand what is the way of thinking in Kremlin and uh, and uh, what can uh, what can happen in in in, in their decision making i doubt if you know lukashenko and putin personal uh, relationship is playing uh, any kind of important role well you know much better uh, was that uh, you know friendship or love or, or or some kind of you know cohabitation uh, i think that you know much more important is really uh, uh, know how in Kremlin they are understanding the whole the whole developments in that very large area you know uh, because there are very important uh, we can call coincidences or, or whatever you know but they are showing that uh, some some much more important uh, factors are starting to play a role if you compare with friendship in between of Lukashenko and and Putin first of all at the same time, you can see, you know, Belarus and Khabarovsk in Far East. That is one, you know, thing which you, which we need to take to take into account. Then, you know, uh, well, of course, Kyrgyzstan is different, but nevertheless, you can see that all, you know, around the uh, Russian, you know, borders, outskirts are becoming, you know, are becoming really turbulent, even Nagorny Karabakh. Uh, so, uh, which means that. Uh, some 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 much more deep developments perhaps are starting to happen the question is what is strategy of moscow what is strategy of putin because i think that he he well at least i hope that he learned some lessons even from ukraine where he you know back in 2014 he decided to stay with yanukovych okay he grabbed you know crimea he he initiated the war in 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 donbass but at the end, the outcome is that he created in the same way, you know, pro-Western uh, orientated Ukrainian nation. He consolidated Putin himself with his all his actions. So after that, we have seen a little different uh, Putin behavior, for example, in Moldova, with, you know, with an agreement to establish Maya Sandu government. Okay, that was for, for quite a short period of time. But nevertheless, uh, that was showing that uh, some some things perhaps uh, Putin started to understand that it's very easy to uh, to uh, antagonize people living in, in 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 such countries like you know Ukraine, Moldova, or Belarus, if if you know if Kremlin is deciding uh, you know not to listen to demand of the people. So that's why I am you know well. I, I don't you know. It's it's difficult to predict uh, Kremlin policy. We can see you know that in diff different cases, like his support uh, for Assad regime in Syria, or you know support for Maduro in Venezuela, sometimes he has no logic. But in this case, especially you know looking into into Ukraine, looking into Belarus, looking into all those you know Eastern Partnership countries, I think that Kremlin is facing uh, quite a big challenge. Because if they are making uh, strategic mistakes and they are staying with, you know, what I call toxic leaders like, you know, Lukashenko, then they need to be ready to lose really uh, 
positive attitude of, of, of people, uh, you know, of ordinary people, and in this case, of ordinary people of Belarus. So that's why I hope that, uh, you know, at, I don't know how long it can go, but at some time, I think that Putin will need to decide that it's time for change. Uh, it's time to abandon Lukashenko and maybe to start to look into possibilities to at least to have some instruments to influence, you know, uh, political developments in, in democratic Belarus. Uh, thank you. Uh, Artyom, I will ask you the same to comment on this and then we turn to the questions from the audience because we have quite many. Uh, what about the Belarusian people stance towards Russia? How do you say that? Because this is not an anti-Russian, not geopolitical revolution. To what extent the current event in Belarus uh, changed people's attitudes towards Russia? I would say that the events themselves do not change attitudes vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but the behavior of Russia very well may change those attitudes. Because as you rightly said, the attitudes of Belarusians towards Russia until now was very friendly. If you take any independent poll, the majority, overwhelming majority, I mean, 70 plus percent supported economic integration with Russia. So the status quo, basically. Uh, the very small minority supported joining Russia, merging in one state. So this was a very un unpopular position. Uh, below 10% was usually the, the number of the people who supported the unification of two countries. Uh, about uh, 15, sometimes up to 20% supported the deeper union, sort of deeper integration, maybe on economic uh, areas like single currency and so on. Uh, so the majority was somewhere in this, you know, the, the consensus has start, is started to be formed in Belarus, where the majority overwhelmingly support good neighboring, I mean, I, I would say even like relations of uh, alliance, alliance with Russia, but at the same time with pre preservation of Belarusian sovereignty as a non-negotiable um, value. Uh, however, uh, I think that if we poll Belarusians now, and we don't have such polls, unfortunately. I mean, it's too 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 hard to conduct them during COVID, and especially uh, in Belarus. Um, but if we were to poll people now, I would uh, suspect, it's my guess, that the pro-Russian orientations would diminish because of the fact that Putin has basically associated himself with Lukashenko. Uh, it's not that Russia has supported Belarus, a Belarusian regime, I mean, unequivocally and unconditionally and uh, for the rest of the days. I mean, it is evident for many that this support is conditional, that Russia is also pressurizing towards constitutional reform in Belarus. Lavrov ke keeps mentioning it in every interview that the constitutional reform should be, should be conducted without delay, that it should be inclusive, and so on and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, most of the ordinary people, they do not even the protesters do not, you know, read between the lines of what Lavrov says. They see that Putin has supported Lukashenko, recognized his victory, uh, even promised to provide uh, military support if the need would come. And so people do associate it, many people do associate it with siding with Lukashenko. And I, I have, I mean, examples even in my own family where people of the older generation, so, so to say, of, of my family, have been traditionally what you could describe as pro-Russian. They supported Crimea annexation. They do not support the uh, West, generally speaking. At the same time, they are not pro-Lukashenko. They are very much anti-Lukashenko, oppositional. And so now, with Putin taking this position, this constituency have started to be disappointed in Russia. For example, my father-in-law could not any uh, cannot anymore. Uh, watch Russian TV because of this, because Russian TV has sort of become anti-protest, anti-Belarusian anti protest. And this is, I think, not just an anecdotal story. Uh, I think this is more widespread. And uh, I think that, uh, generally speaking, the pro-Russian human-to-human uh, -human attitude will not change a lot unless uh, or until we get into some dire conflict between two countries and two peoples. But I think the attitudes towards Putin and towards Kremlin is becoming worse because uh, actually Vladimir Putin has for, for many years been a more popular leader in Belarus than Lukashenko. It is a myth that Lukashenko has ever uh, enjoyed a large support in Belarus. Any independent poll has shown that his support was always below 50%. Uh, Vladimir Putin's was not. But now I think they are maybe getting closer to one another. 
Thank you. Now I will turn to the questions from the audience. I will read two at once. One is probably even more amended for you, Mr. Kubilius. I was wondering why the EU sanction list does not include a very clear statement saying everyone who participated in human rights violations and current crimes against civilians will be banned from entering the EU for at least 10 years. Then the second question is by uh, the Executive uh, Director of the Morton Center, Tommy Huchtanen. Any predictions how the situation will develop, fading out or escalating conflict? This question is probably for both of you. Mr. Kubilius, would you like to begin? Uh, good question. No, well, um, I'm not a uh, big expert on, on sanctions and all instruments, but uh, you know that uh, uh, the first uh, steps uh, done by EU were a little bit, you know, not so 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 clear. Uh, Baltic states immediately included, you know, much larger list of people into sanction list. Uh, EU was hesitating about including uh, Lukashenko, so. That's that's how EU is working, you know. It's you cannot expect, you know, EU to be very, you know, very effective, very rapid, very, very, you know, very, very clear in its decision making. But things are moving. Go ahead. Uh, second point, which which is important, uh, and uh, where you know member states can look into into new possibilities, and that is what we started to discuss with our foreign affairs minister. Now, of course, Lithuania also is going through elections, so it's not very clear now <laughs> how long uh, this government or new government will 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 be formed. But we asked, uh, and since you know Belarusian uh, issues, so-called Belarusian issues, uh, has a consensus, you know, in in Lithuania, so we asked uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs to look into possibilities that. Uh, uh, so-called ban on Schengen visas uh, could be introduced uh, by Lithuania alone to a much larger list of uh, perpetrators. Now, that's uh, not very clear procedural from procedural point of view, but Lithuania, which has uh, its own Magnitsky you know, law, can do it. The question is, you know, if Lithuania will prohibit, uh, let's say, uh, all all those who are included into Trykovsky list, you know, to enter uh, to enter Lithuania, how it could be expanded to all territory of European Union? And I think that here are some uh, political steps which Lithuania can uh, initiate, because if Lithuania is introducing some kind of this ban of visas. So all the Schengen uh, area authorities, responsible authorities, will know that Lithuania uh, did such a step, you know, uh, uh, ban, you know, introducing the ban on 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 uh, on, on visa. Uh, of course, other countries can issue visas for those, you know, personalities. But if to do it. Uh, from the Lithuanian side, if to do it in a you know effective political way, to have negotiations with all others, I think that some 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 new type of sanctions can be introduced. And the last point is exactly at least we were informed. I don't know now. I'm not able to follow, but uh, we were informed that today or maybe tomorrow, uh, Commission European Commission is finally coming out with uh, a proposal on so-called EU wide Magnitsky law which would allow EU to be much more effective really in introducing some kind of those visas or of those of those sanctions. So on on second question on scenarios, well it's you know I think that we were talking quite quite a lot with Artyom about different scenarios. And uh, I see really, you know it it will depend very much on on how long you know Kremlin will support Lukashenko despite uh, despite uh, you know all all evidence that uh, uh, that uh, opposition is not weakening its protest in the streets, even coming out with some kind of ultimatums, and uh, it will depend also you know uh, how uh, from EU side, from the Western Community side, uh, EU will be able to communicate or to send clear messages 
what kind of big mistakes Putin will make if he will stay with Lukashenko. That is what, what uh, and that is why exactly, you know, Svetlana Sikhanovskaya international visits uh, starting from, from Brussels, then to, to Angela Merkel, to Emmanuel Macron, uh, you know, meeting them, I think are playing a very important role. Just to jump on maybe on the second question about the scenarios, again, I agree with Mr. Kapilius that uh, much will depend on how soon Russia will change its course, because I think it's it's nearly inevitable that some course correction will happen because uh, their interests of Lukashenko and Putin are not completely overlapping uh, in Belarusian situation. And um, I think that if we look only on domestic, I mean, developments, all the predictions by by now have have proven wrong. That is why I'm pretty sure that all the predictions that I am able to give now will also be you know not 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 turn uh, precise and correct. At the same time, I th I see two possible let's say fringe ways as fringe ways uh, in terms of how how the situation can evolve, and we are now somewhere in between those in between those two fringes. So one way is the escalation, another powerful escalation, a forceful escalation of violence. And there are several prerequisites for it. I mean, that are we already starting to observe. There is on the part of the protesters, the fatigue uh, with the fact that uh, peaceful protesters, peaceful protests for more than two months have not brought, uh, uh, I mean, the evident victory. And so there are, not, there are now some occasional instances of damaging of property of police uh, officers, um, threats to their families, de-anonymization of police officers and their places of residence. Um, recently, people started to uh, tear down masks from the hands, from the faces of the police. It's not that all of this is necessarily lethal, but this frames police to a more, even more harsher response. It angers them even more and creates a futile ground for for more violence from the police side. And on this side, on the regime side, we see even more, you know, readiness to use force, at least uh, verbally. Uh, it, there is now every day an interview with some police chief in Belarus uh, who is basically threatening to use uh, firearms uh, against the protesters under this or that pretext. Usually it, it is uh, explained by the fact that there are no more peaceful protesters and everybody who is on the street is just a uh, uh, some uh, guerrilla fighter and some thug, and we will use all the force necessary. So this is this atmosphere is being, you know, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, built up as we speak. Uh, so there is some ground for this fringe scenario. Another one is a gradual withering out of protests because uh, it is hard to protest for, I mean, a year. It is hard to protest for many months without evident and obvious victories. And the numbers are gradually decreasing. So if in the mid-August we have seen uh, 105,000 from two, I mean, minimal demonstration in Minsk on Sunday, I think it sometimes reached, I mean, exceeded even 200,000 uh, in Minsk. Now we are in the five digit, which is still very remarkable. It's probably 50,000, 40,000, somewhere along these lines in Minsk, but it is less. And so uh, if the winter comes, the cold winter comes, uh, it is likely that the protests will lose the current numbers. They will not die out entirely. I believe that Lukashenko rule now will be uh, marked by the protests all, I mean, for as long as he has left, I think there will be protests in Belarus on of this or that scale. However, the current large protests can somewhat subside. And we are now in between those. Uh, where the regime does not make two foolish mistakes to provoke another, you know, escalation, another round of strikes, another round of defections. Uh, but at the same time, it does provide enough triggers because the repressions the regime is doing are sometimes ugly, sometimes provocative, and sometimes they, you know, add fuel to the fire, so to say. And uh, this maintains protest at some level. So we are now in this middle ground, and I think that it is very likely that the situation will tilt towards some of these fringes in the future. We are either heading for another escalation, which is not unlikely. I am 
sorry to say, and or we are heading towards some, uh, you know, uh, subsiding of the protest activity. Thank you. Uh, since we have six more minutes uh, left, I have two more questions to read and then maybe also leave uh, space for your concluding remarks if you have any. Uh, well, question one, what do you think about Vladimir Pastukov's thesis that repressions in Belarus mean the end of the, the era of peaceful revolutions in the region? As he said, Gandhism is over. And the second question, is there dissent among the people in the security apparatus? Um, whoever wants to jump, whoever wants to answer first? Well, uh, maybe I, I don't know so much about dissent, you know, but uh, uh, if to continue a little bit, you know, uh, and to jump into the first question and to continue what we were speaking before, absolutely, you know, I agree with that terms that it's, you know, it's difficult to predict uh, that protests will be able to to continue on such a high you know level of uh, of of numbers you know and so on and so on. But uh, from another side, I know I I would uh, I would make a very simple conclusion. Then you know if if uh, we we can you know discuss uh, will the protest uh, you know become uh, no tired or so on and so on so we we need to take into account that regime also is you know not very happy with with uh, you know situation but they cannot win again against uh, protesters so that's that what makes uh, really very difficult to predict how things will develop uh, but uh, since we have seen how things were developing till now no, after after they, they started to happen somewhere in, in June and in July, I would say that we are witnessing you know totally different type of revolution, which is uh, very difficult to compare with any anything you know, uh, with Gandhi or not Gandhi, with with our you know revolution in 1990s you know. Uh, and we had even even in Lithuania very similar you know, conclusions at the very beginning. Look, there are no clear leadership. Where is the Landsberg is you know, our, our first you know, leader of our Soviet movement? They do not have Landsberg, they do not have you know, real political parties, real ideologies, and so on and so on. But uh, perhaps this is the first, really, 21st uh, century revolution, which we can call, I don't know, you know online revolution or, or whatever. Uh, when you see how much what a big influence is 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 you know played by telegram channels and, and things like that so my conclusion is very simple it's impossible to predict how things will uh, go on it's impossible to predict what kind of you know what what new forms protest will uh, will acquire during during you know next period of time uh, so uh, but i am still you know uh, optimist on, 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 on the basic uh, conclusion and I do not agree with that you know I, I remember I don't remember his name you mentioned you know uh, this uh, article on, on, on the peaceful peaceful you know protest is, is, o is over I, I don't think so because uh, I see some kind you know of uh, historical uh, historical uh, you know major developments which perhaps started to happen in Belarus, they can spread into some other uh, countries. Uh, and, and that's why I think that, you know, uh, if we are looking from that point of view, so we cannot predict what, what forms, you know, this revolution will, 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 will take in the future. But I am, I am, again, you know, pretty, pretty optimistic about uh, what will be the outcome. Yeah, just very briefly on the security apparatus, there are no uh, signs of cracks at the upper level of it. There have been defections from the lower mid-level of the various security and law enforcement agencies. I mean, most most of them, prosecutor's office, investigative committee, the police, uh, there have been resignations on the local uh, level, but not on the top level. And there are many reasons for this. Uh, We'll not get uh, deeper into this, but I mean, uh, they're all well written in the theory of political transitions. Uh, and on the Pastuhov question, I mean, Pastuhov, who is the political scientist who has coined this, you know, phrase that the peaceful revolutions are now over, I don't think that he is comparing like with like. 
uh, Belarusian regime is not that kind of regime um, that is comparable to the regimes that, fell, that has fallen under peaceful revolutions. So if you look at Kyrgyzstan, if you look at Armenia, if you look at Ukraine, Georgia before Saakashvili, um, and other places where the peaceful uh, revolutions have won, even the late Poland, late communist Poland, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, Hungary, um, these places have not been such uh, consolidated authoritarian regimes as the Belarus today. And the more you, the, the upper you go at, on, at this ladder of, you know, authoritarian consolidation and readiness to use brutal force, the, the more uh, price society has to pay to topple this kind of regime. Because Belarus is not just another post-Soviet, you know, uh, uh, hybrid uh, regime. It is a consolidated authoritarian, um, some describe it as tyrannical, I mean, dictatorship. This is uh, the regime similar to a Gaddafi one in Libya without such, of course, level of violence preceding this. Uh, this is akin to regimes in Central Asia. Uh, these kind of regimes, historically speaking, unfortunately, take a lot of lives with them out before, before they fall. And in this regards, the Belarusian revolution so far has been uh, remarkably uh, peaceful and even, I mean, non-violent non, non uh, uh, comparing to the similar regimes. Um, and that is why... Uh, if we will speak about the future post-Soviet regimes that will, I mean, come victim to the revolutions and revolts, it will again depend on how consolidated and how authoritarian the, these regimes are. It's way easier to topple a Yanukovych, you know, fractured uh, regime than it is uh, to do with um, the kind of regime we have here. Um, I'll probably stop here. We do not hear. Thank you very much. We approach the end of our discussion. I would like to thank you very much for your cont contribution. I think we had a fruitful discussion on these developments. We hope uh, for the best turn of the events in Belarus, and also we will uh, follow closely the situation. Until then, uh, Artyom, stay safe. Uh, but also all of us uh, coping dealing with this pandemic. Uh, also to all the to all of our viewers, follow us because we have many upcoming events. And next week also we have the Economic Ideas Forum. Uh, have a lovely afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.